Good afternoon, fellow citizens. Welcome back to the Citizens Chat Show. My name is Masisa Demiano, and uh, your show host for for these uh, conversations on the here on the Citizens uh, Chat Show hashtag uh, Chat Show UG. And uh, today we are discussing, of course, uh, the states uh, of the nation, the economic, the state of the address of uh, the, the 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 president on the economy, but also importantly is to to. Uh, harmonize it and with the, with the current economic uh, situation that is happening in the country today, and we want to ask questions whether the speech actually responded to 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 the the, the, the economy today, the situations that is happening around, whether the speech actually provided for solutions that are that are around today that possibly the people would want to to hear. And uh, I joined on the panel today uh, are a team uh, and my literally my regular panelists that I will hope uh, put us to speed on to what transpired and how the economy is uh, happening today and how it's functioning. And joined on the panel to discuss this is uh, today is seated right close to me, almost call, we call him the government, uh, retired Major Awich Pola, is uh, the Direct External Services with NRM. Uh, Fando, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, viewers. Uh, thank you. And uh, right uh, from... Uh, I found the witch is uh, the lady in red, uh, Dr. Sarah Birete. Uh, Sarah, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. I come from Bushen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bushen is not much with red. Yes, yeah. We grew up yes, yeah. during the butter days. Ah, a home of a butter. Interesting. That's a good one. It's good to keep his story, but mm. it's a <laughs> 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 and finally, our, our East African, the historian, and uh, uh, Professor Mwedesan uh, Devesa Mwambusia, you're welcome. Thank you. For me, I'm from East Africa. From East Africa. Uh, yeah. And uh, of in course... The, in the province of Uganda. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and uh, actually, uh, th that also reminds us, since, since we went to... And just went last uh, on Wednesday, we, we celebrated the African Day. It would be interesting to hear your perspective. Uh, each one of you on the panel on uh, how far we've come as a continent uh, socially and economically. Especially that you Pan-Africanists, we could underscore and see whether we've performed as a continent in celebration of the African Day. I would want to start with, uh, with the government today. On Pan-Africa? Oh, how we've uh, fared as a, as a continent, as a Africa. Oh, yes. The celebration of uh... the African Day. It is worthwhile celebrating African Day because it is, focuses our mind and draws our consciousness close to the continent and we reevaluate ourselves how far we have gone. Uh, in a nutshell, we still have challenges. We have still insecurity around. We are not yet united as some people had visualized at one time, the Nkrumah and the rest. But more importantly is that we still form the greater part of the North-South divide. The North-South divide is say, that manifested clearly in the fact that when we produce raw materials, the cost of the raw materials have continued to come down. Mm -hmm. For example, a Land Rover in 1960 made in UK, if it costed 20 bags of coffee, that same Land Rover now is costing 60 bags of coffee. It is still the same Land Rover. So the North-South divide has continued and we in Africa form the big bulk of the South. So we keep manufacturing raw materials. The only way to come out of this is if we were talking as a united voice. Because if you want to raise the value of your product alone and your other neighbor is willing to sell cheaply, you can't make it. So it is good to have a focused day the one day where we focus our consciousness, where we think as one, where we think in terms of solidarity, and we see how far. And we also see how we can go beyond rhetoric. What are the leaders practically doing to see that we get out of this? Otherwise, it becomes rhetoric, and we shall remain in that economically enslaving situation. Interesting. Uh, Sarah, what do you make of uh, the African day, our, our socioeconomic uh, impact as of now? You see, as a continent, we we have completed six decades of independence. But we still have leaders blaming the underdevelopment, blaming the poverty, blaming the imbalance of trade, 
on the former colonial masters mm -hmm. without doing much. Uh, I, my co-panelist has talked about the uh, cost of bag of, of coffee. What is the state of that coffee? President Museven, more than about 37 years ago, was talking about value addition. He's still talking about value addition after being in charge of the country for 37 years. He came to power when I was less than 10 years old. Still talking the same rhetoric on the economy. Very addition. We are donors. We donate our coffee. Coffee which costs less than $1 a day. It is brought back on the continent at almost $20 a day. And that's why the cost of Land Rover, we have the number of coffee bags increasing. Mm. But what are we doing beyond rhetoric? I am a practicing Pan-Africanist. Unfortunately, the organization of Africans in Uganda and diaspora has been curtailed by the same regime that hosted the African Secretariat, Pan-African Secretariat, mm. and killed the mood of Africans mobilizing, pursuing for reparations, and all the other things that they need to do, including harmonizing and coordinating with Africans in diaspora. Mm -hmm. Ghana has started robbing back the rich diaspora the descendants of slaves to come back. Other countries have serious programs in reinvesting money. Because if you look at the Nobel Prize winners, half of them are Africans, either from Africa or in diaspora. People mm -hmm. inventing things, people inventing knowledge, people inventing, you know, methods and solutions for challenges of that day. Half of them are, are, are blacks, Africans. But what do we benefit as a continent? Or what are we <clears throat> doing? For example, we are going into the fourth industrial re revolution. Mm -hmm. All re repressive regimes in the country have curtailed internet freedom. Our Facebook has been closed for, four years, for about two years. People who are doing business on Facebook, nobody's bothered about them. So this is the kind of, you, the, the actions don't match the rhetoric for six decades, unfortunately. It is a shame. Interesting. That's some of uh, the, the messages we need to keep uh, hearing and the reactions we need to, to have on uh, such a day. Uh, professor, as a historian, what do you say? Uh, thank you. Um, just to join the voice of uh, um, fellow Pan-Africanists, but that name, that tag, is no longer saying. Yes. <laughs> when you say you are Pan-Africanist, there are some people who will actually dismiss what you are going to say, unfortunately. Mm. But that doesn't mean that the struggle for uniting Africans, uh, both uh, in terms of states as well as the mind, uh, should be neglected. Uh, the challenge that uh, Pan-Africanism has had in the last six decades is that it has been hijacked by the states. It is now state Pan-Africanism, not citizens Pan-Africanism. It was actually literally uh, hijacked. Mm. And that is why it is no longer actually a very big issue that is commemorated. And even those business of Africa days, people no longer think about them. So it is under state capture. That is where it went wrong. Mm. And initially, the goals and objectives of Pan-Africanism uh, were, for example, uh, overcoming colonialism, overcoming apartheid in South Africa, so that Africa regains its dignity and its independence, which it had before it was uh, a, a, a colonized in all ways than one. The challenge, however, is that somehow, even in rhetoric, people have got stuck on the original goals as if society and history does not change. Mm. For example, my Pan-Africanism today would be addressing the issues of the day mm -hmm. without, of course, forgetting the other, the, the, the past ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had administrative political colonialism, mm -hmm. but now we have got the colonialism of ideas. Mm -hmm. 
all the almost all African countries are following neoliberal policies. And then that shows that we are not independent. The World Bank is a knowledge bank and it and we are importing those ideas and they are the ones that are controlling us. That's why we are talking about free market every day. When you talk about the state coming in, uh, where there are these problems of price going up, you will always be told, but we are living in a free market economy. Free market economy was not our idea. Mm. It was idea, uh, an idea from somewhere else. So we are still colonized. You know, uh, colonizing somebody using, uh, twisting his arm is less dangerous than twisting the mind. So we, our minds were colonized. Secondly, we have got stuck on uh, this business of how Europe had developed Africa. Mm -hmm. It is time also we thought about how Africans are developing and developing themselves. Because like we are underdeveloped politically mm -hmm. in terms of democracy. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the democracy, immediately people will say there are always elections. No, no, no. That's just one element of democracy. The other elements are, for example, equality mm -hmm. of citizens. We do not have it. We have participation of citizens equally in the governance of their uh, resources and, and power. Uh, and power. Mm -hmm. But now increasingly, we are having more repression. We are increasingly having more unequal society than even when colonialism was here. So it is as if people are... Uh, 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 following in the footsteps of Renyankwele saying that uh, the hyena from your area eats you in a better way. For some of us, uh, whether it, the hyena is from your area or from outside your area, mm. it still eats you and you become a meal. So it doesn't matter whether the exploiter was a white, an Indian, or an African. So it is time we set ourselves on a new agenda to liberate Africa using AU and using other fora to liberate economically, to fight recolonization, but also to fight things like inequality, inequality of wealth, inequality of income, inequality of power, inequality of gender, and the, and the likes. Mm -hmm. Is AU now focusing on that one? Is the Pan-African movement focusing, for example, on the gender question, on the equality question, on the class question? Mm -hmm. It is not on democracy question. They are just uh, being driven by those in power who already have fallen into things, as we normally say, and they don't mind about the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed. Because you cannot fight colonial oppression and replace it with state oppression. Yes. That is not liberation. So liberation, emancipation, should be our, at the, at the fore of the new Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. So I think the new generation should set itself the agenda to set new goals for Pan-Africanism and not get stuck in the old agendas. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think you yeah, uh, follow up <laughs> on, uh, on what Professor is saying mm -hmm. about the old agenda of Pan-Africanism vis-a-vis the, the current challenges. I wish the viewers to learn that the original Pan-Africanism started from outside Africa. We are here in Africa at the moment with 54 states, 54 countries mm. uh, with members of AU. It was 53 when Morocco left because of the West Saharan thing, but they were, Morocco is back. Now in the membership of African Union where all states are in, countries are represented, we are 54. Now the Pan-African itself started from outside Africa. Why? Because the Africans who were in the diaspora, the blacks who were in Europe and America, felt oppression. So it was a reaction. It wasn't a, a pro-action. It was a reaction of this oppression abroad that made them feel Pan-African. And that is how the movement started. Then it came back to the African mainland. Now, that means that if it started from abroad, even the agenda was designed that way mm -hmm. from the oppressed people abroad. But that's why I was saying the contemporary challenge is now, is us as South, the Africa South vis-a-vis -vis the North. 
how do we now link with the north south in terms of our resources and that's why i brought in the knowledge of the coffee bags with the north producing land rover but the original pan african did not start in africa it started from the africans who were oppressed in the diaspora mm. it just came back to africa interesting interesting uh, so the principle right of there. oppression is at the heart of pan africanism yes so is there no oppression in Africa now? That's a question to answer. Yeah, it's interesting. And uh, of course, uh, that conversation can always go on. <laughs> we need to really have a separate uh, day for it. But we just wanted to at least add our voice on to uh, the celebrations that uh, just happened uh, on Wednesday. But importantly, getting into our conversation today, uh, just Sunday, uh, uh, five days from now on 22nd, the president came out through to make an address on the economy. And uh, we all were all glued on to see whether there are other, uh, what the government has in stock to ensure that uh, at least the situation changes. I, all this discussion, I would want to hear and possibly would want to hear from our panelists today. If there are those that uh, we feel uh, there, there, there are ways, uh, there are recommendations or there are solutions that the government provided, and we want to hear from them. Uh, on uh, Before we could get into the real discussion and of course uh, the, the address itself, Individual, I would also want to invite you to just uh, tell our viewers, possibly the viewers would want to know how the economic situation is affecting each one of us today. How are we feeling the situation today? Is it, are we, are we on course or the other challenges? Professor, I would want to start from you that side. That you are talking what we call truism. <laughs> you are asking. <laughs> maybe maybe, maybe <laughs> you, you, you could point out is one no, or two uh, issues that you feel really. These ones. I really, uh, there is really nobody honest. who is not in state power mm. uh, who is not feeling the pinch. Mm. But those who are in power, they are not feeling <clears> the pinch <throat> because uh, they are using free fuel, mm. uh, free vehicles, and the free accommodation, uh, some of them. Uh, but those of us who are outside the power, mm -hmm. definitely one way or the other, whether you are rich or poor or middle or whatever, you are negatively impacted by this uh, economic slump what is happening right now especially of the rise of commodities it is affecting me in many respects than one in terms of feeding in terms of transport mm -hmm. uh, i can now now not even buy a new trouser or a shirt mm -hmm. that is out those are things yeah, that luxury. We, 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 <laughs> those are luxuries <laughs> so you can imagine spending a whole year without <clears throat> buying any type of uh, new growth now uh, we are definitely affected and when uh, the, pr the prices are high, you are affected the, uh, financially, but financially translates into how you feed. Mm -hmm. uh, even your psychology, you don't sleep very well, in case you fall sick or the person close to you fall sick. You know, in Africa, we have got very many people we are looking after. Mm -hmm. So we are negatively impacted one way or the other. So mm -hmm. if that is what you wanted to mm -hmm. ask, but I don't know whether you wanted me to comment on the speech. No, that will come. We'll yeah, come just yeah, Sarah, as a farmer, for you maybe <laughs> speaking from the speech, it looks like the farmers are doing well. <laughs> <laughs> that the speech had nothing. Anyway, I, I think really starting from <clears throat> the reopening of schools, mm -hmm. there was almost a double increment on fees. The transport to people struggling to drop their children to and from home, mm -hmm. school and back home. The cost of transport. People are moving half journeys, those who stay out of town. Mm -hmm. Others are walking to work, except we have a message who is prohibited from walking, which I think is unfair to him as a person. His individual rights and freedoms matter, as well as those of anybody else. So we have many people working on the roads. Mm -hmm. We have a big decrease in traffic jam. I stay quite out of town. I, I refer to, to my place as up country. No, the volume of vehicles would meet on the road has decreased to almost by a half. I'm sure a traffic jam generally in town has decreased. People have packed vehicles. The pump costs are really way out of, of the ordinary. 
the cost of fuel has doubled for, for every person who is consuming fuel. Whatever mm. I used to use to consume full tank, you, you need double the amount. But also people who used to put in 20,000, because many people don't really buying a full tank is a luxury of a fuel. People who used to move a distance with 20,000 and get back home, now they run out of fuel on the road. Many people are moving with jerkans in their cars, those who are still driving. So it's a very difficult situation. Mm. And no wonder they have said about 40% of people in Kampara are mad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then the cost, of, the cost of feeding. So everybody mm. needs to be checked. Yeah, the cost of feeding, the cost of buying essentials like soap. Mm. Really, it is way too much for an ordinary citizen. The government, what is, how is it on your side? Because of course, they... well, I cannot deny the fact that uh, the economic situation is being felt. And I like to disagree with the professors that those who are in government are not feeling, we're feeling it. I'm in the party, but the ruling party. I, most of my income are from my investment. And whatever I used to have to use for that investment, now cannot do, cannot do buy what I used to buy. Of course, we are feeling it. But as a uh, party, you have fuel cards No, we don't have. We are a pro-people party. This is a party for the masses. We know. And that is why we have even refused for even selling party card or even selling t-shirts. This is a pro people, a mass party, a revolutionary mass party. Who doesn't? Know? And if you come, you should come with sacrifice. So we don't have fear. Mm. Now, uh, so the effect is felt. But of course, uh, it has, it, it, first of all, it is not as bad as we may think. Because last time I quoted the statistics here, which was said by humanitarian bodies on BBC, that every 48 seconds, somebody dies in the three countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, Somalia. And I was paying clear attention to know whether Uganda would be mentioned. Uganda wasn't. And it, the report was by a global humanitarian body. So... Uh, we have challenges, including where there was sunshine, I mean, last, last but year. But you see, those are countries with mm. conflict. Does yes. that mean that so, Uganda is so, okay? Uh, while I note and we do note that the current economic status is biting to all, mm -hmm. uh, and nobody is excluded, I will also do note that it is not as bad as can be expressed. Because I was quoting a statistics which was quoted by international humanitarian bodies that every 48 seconds, seconds, not minutes, somebody dies mm. in the Horn of Africa. That is Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya. So Uganda is not one of those areas that is marked. Because not so we are world. not that bad yet. Uh, we have come, part of the country which had the That's sunshine the last year. And they are supposed to have faced famine now. But it has not yet manifested. And we hope that the food that we have in stock will run them through. But even in our markets, we have it. So much as it is true that the economic status is biting, is not that alarming. Besides, in the long run, as we run the government and provide services to the people in terms of roads and hospital and all that, the taxation process also borrows from it. So it is a sign. So we benefit as a government, as a country, but we also suffer as individuals. Mm. But I think, as we will discuss, most of the issues are addressed. The remedies are contained in the president's speech. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let, let me that bring in one. Professor. Now, getting into the speech, <laughs> and uh, at least my, uh, we must have, if you've, you didn't get a chance to, to listen to it uh, live while he was, he was making it, at least you must have uh, uh, got hold of the copy and uh, read through it. So to, to ask, uh, Professor, does the president's speech respond to the realities of the day? But importantly, responding to the contractual obligation government has with its people. I don't know the realities of the day, what they were, what they are. It depends from which point of view. Mm. And there is the reality of you, who is not in the government, and the reality of those who are 
in the government. So there are very many realities. Because now for, for the president to come out to say that I'm giving a state of the economy, meaning that there's, there's something that is not right. Well, really. He could be yeah. saying a state of the economy when he's actually doing other things. I, I will give you even those other things and then go to the economy. Yes. Uh, for example, he was legitimizing himself in power. And uh, uh, he was quoting statistics selectively. You know, our colleague has been uh, giving statistics Statistics can lie, uh, and it depends how you selectively use them. Uh, one of those figures don't lie. They lie. Mm -hmm. It depends how you are selecting them, because <laughs> you select figures that will support your position. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me give you the figures. Uh, for example, uh, he politicized COVID, and he said COVID uh, 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 was uh, the, the new wave. Uh? The, the other second wave was due to opposition. But before he did that, he also gave figures of uh, those who died of COVID and who other suffered countries, COVID yes. and other countries. So mm. he selected those in Europe mm. and left out Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. You know, COVID affected Sub-Saharan Africa differently from Europe. Mm. He did give us the figures of Rwanda or Sudan or Congo or Cameroon or Central African Republic or Chad. No, he gave those of Europe. Because they are very comparable. The, the figures of people who died and co and caught to COVID in Sub-Saharan Africa are comparable. You don't compare them with those of Europe. You talked of South Africa? Well, yeah. South Africa is almost South Europe. Africa is what is Sub-Saharan Africa hmm. about to uh, about South Africa hmm. in terms of, of, of living, in terms of congestion, climate. in terms of even the climate because yeah. they are in the temperate region. Hmm. But he didn't use Sub-Saharan Africa. Deliberately, in order to give those glaring differences of figures in Europe compared to Uganda. He didn't give those of Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. And then he went ahead to say uh, that it is the opposition. He politicized now the opposition, that it is the opposition which led to the spite mm -hmm. in Uganda. First mm. of all, much of the COVID was in Kampala. Opposition was not allowed to campaign in Kampala, you remember? There was a lot of COVID in Arua, and Moyo, Kabare, Tororo. I don't think that is where opposition was most. In any case, how many opposition members, even who are active, whom mm. you saw those youth, really contracted uh, COVID-19, or even their family members? Mm. Because it was, not, it was not selective. It mainly affected those who are in urban centers. So he just wanted to uh, politicize uh, uh, politicize COVID mm. in both the statistics and also uh, attributing it to uh, 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 the opposition. But coming back to addressing the challenges of price hikes. Mm -hmm. um, true, uh, this, uh, this inflation and these price hikes uh, have external uh, origins. And others are internal, others are external. And the government's all over the world, including East Africa, have come up to ameliorate the situation because uh, Kenya is, is either subsidizing or, or, or reducing taxes. I think Tanzania has even asked IMF to help them so that they can subsidize. Uh, but Uganda says, for us, we shall not. And then, again, back to the question of statistics, the way you present it. Uh, you had the president say that uh, for example, taxes on wheat, taxes on rice, taxes on uh, sugar, when you reduce them, they may become something like, is it 500 billion? And we cannot do that. Remember, nobody says, argues, that you reduce taxes completely. See, he's using absolute figures to scare you that it will be 500 billion. No, we are saying reduce by a certain <coughs> small percentage. He says, when if you reduce prices like say on fuel, I mean uh, taxes on fuel, you, you you reduce like say two billion. Nobody is talking in absolute terms. We are saying reduce by a certain percentage of the taxes. Then uh, that will leave something for the government. But then uh, they they continue to argue that even that reduction that you can make the tax reduction that you can make on some of those critical inputs may not make much difference because in the perception of those who are say uh, selling fuel 
they will still uh, continue selling uh, highly. Mm. Now, the government, we have a representative of government here, they say they are revolutionaries, they are pro-people, they are uh, 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 even Marxist-oriented, and things like that. Now, <laughs> listen to this one. I know a, a little bit of that kind of stuff they are talking about. I have that foundation. Mm. Now, at the normative level, the principles that guide a government, a progressive government, at the heart of it, is the interests of the masses. Mm. Now, why on earth doesn't Uganda have a consumer protection law? Mm. And under that law, you regulate the how much. If you calculate and you reduce taxes, like say, 80%, sorry, 20% from fuel, then you go and talk to these oil importers and sellers that please, since we have reduced taxes by this percentage, you should also cap your prices along these lines. Of course, you continue uh, adjusting uh, as the international prices continue, mm. but we don't have a citizen's mm. consumer protection law. But that law and the policy would be informed by a progressive mm. mind, mm. a progressive mind, not the one of lip service. Mm -hmm. So in Uganda, we don't have a consumer protection law, and that is the people's government. Because you can reduce those taxes, not in absolute terms as he wanted to present it, because the way he presented it is, is as if we are saying reduce all the taxes and complete them. No! Reduce by a certain percentage on this, on that, on that, on that. Cumulatively, it will go to a certain level, and then when the traders continue overcharging when you have even reduced taxes on those imports, then you come up with a consumer protection law. You don't just leave the peasants, the workers, the ordinary citizens of Uganda, when you are a progressive government, to the vagaries of the market. You don't do that. So the, if you do that, then you are a bourgeois. Yeah, professor. A bourgeois uh, government, not the, the revolutionary one they, they want us to believe mm. that they are. So the president argues, in, uh, in, uh, in, he went on to, to argue that uh, when they are just coming to power after Amin, there's, he quotes one uh, Indian called Gandesha, who at that point, when they came in, he had hiked uh, prices of, uh, of rentals. Yeah, his rent was too high. Then, then they told him to, to, to actually remove the, the rental act. To, to revoke it and actually put a regulation. Then he said, no, let's leave it free flowing to allow many other players come into, into, into the sector. From then, prices will normalize and, uh, and, uh, and you know, like you have many players and the prices literally goes into, into regulation in that way. So, so he felt that was the way that to go. And in here, he's arguing for the same that I think when you allow many players come in, then in a way we shall have uh, reduced uh, prices. How many people sleep in slums in Uganda, mm. in spite of those houses? Mm. Existence of houses is not equal to sheltering citizens. Mm. Even this business of saying we have got surplus, you have surplus milk, how many people take milk? Mm. When you, ha you see goods on the market, you see many goods on the market, it mm. is not an implication that there is surplus and people are satisfied. It is that people have no buying purchase capacity to mm. purchase those goods. If you look at, uh, at it from the point of view, how many liters of milk citizens should take every day on average, you will find that actually we would consume all the milk in Uganda and there wouldn't be anything on the market. Mm. It is because we don't have the purchasing power. So similarly, you cannot say we have got very many houses in Uganda when we have got a housing deficit of almost more than a million households in the whole country. Mm. So it is not that there are too many houses. When you are pro-people, you look at uh, the housing of the majority of the people, not the few elites and the few uh, people who have come from outside and you say, we now have uh, access houses in Uganda. From which point of view? How many Ugandans are sleeping in slums, mm. are sleeping on the street? And those are the people you are supposed to be catering for because you are a people's government. Mm. So we should be having a consumer protection law and then we reduce taxes 
and no, no, we, yeah, we reduce taxes on some of these strategic commodities, not removing completely. We are not talking about removing. We are talking about reducing. Mm. And when you reduce, then the, the, the consumer protection law and policy I'm and speaking. system and norms comes in and you protect the citizens. Mm. Otherwise, leaving the citizens at the vagaries of the market is not what we hear in the rhetoric that this is a people's government. Mm. What is people's about leaving citizens on, at the vagaries of the market? Uh, Sarah, I would want to that bring you capitalism. in at that point. Mm. Yes, to shed also your, your thoughts on whether this speech actually really provided for the solutions that we would want to see today. You see, to me, the president just came to confirm to Ugandans that he doesn't care about their plight. And uh, I, I can summarize his speech using the boiling frog syndrome. His ministers, especially those in finance, the permanent secretary and secretary to treasury, uh, Minister Musei Matia Kasaija, and others had been consistently telling Ugandans that they would do nothing about the commodities. And then the president came, the, ri the rising prices of commodities, mm -hmm. essential commodities. And then the president came to confirm that theory. Why do I compare it with a boiling frog syndrome? You see, a frog has a capacity to adapt mm -hmm. to different temperatures of water. Actually, I was going to ask what that means, okay? Yes, and uh, so when you throw a frog in boiling water, it mm -hmm. has capacity to jump out. Mm -hmm. But what you do, you first place a frog in cold water, similar to the one it's used to. Then you start increasing the temperatures of the water slowly. And the frog keeps standing and saying, okay, then the skin is adapting. Mm -hmm. So the president waited mm -hmm. for Ugandans to adapt to the bad situation mm -hmm. through the rhetoric of his cadres. And he came to exactly confirm that whereas all our neighbors in East Africa <laughs> have done something, Tanzania has increased the salaries of the public servants, mm -hmm. Kenya has increased the middle, the, the minimum wage, Kenya has also been mitigating the cost of the pump through mitigating taxes and putting some money for the importers of fuel mm. and ensuring there is supply. That at one time the people picked money, some suppliers picked money and did not deliver the fuel. So there was a little shortage, an exchange of which Uganda is using. So you see Kenya, even if they are mitigating, things are not going well. No. Mm. The cost of fuel in Kenya is different. Actually, it is equivalent to 4,700 Uganda shillings. The cost of petrol in Kenya. Hmm. Whereas now we have moved to 6,000. So you cannot say that it is nothing. 1,000 is a lot of money. It, it, it would mean much to public transport. It would mean much to people increasing the required fuel to move, hmm. take their children to school and get to work or wherever they need to go. And also it would eventually mitigate all the other costs of essential mm. commodities that is skyrocketing, skyrocketing. So we have, so the president was finally saying, yes, we know you are in the, the, the water in the saucepan is boiling, but you've adjusted enough and I am not getting you out of the boiling water. Mm -hmm. So stay put. Until the vagaries of nature help you. Mm, of capitalism. Yes, that's in, in brief what he said. Mm. And I don't even know if you want to do nothing about the plight of the people. Why are you even taking airtime on TVs and the rest, including those who listened? Why are you wasting their time? Leave them to struggle. Because what difference did it make mm. to the cost of living? Just confirm. The situation is bad, but that's it. Because if you look at the, 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 the total tax on essential commodities, that is cooking oil, soap, and, uh, and generally food and other things that are, and, and fuel, it, it goes up to 4.58 trillion in this budget. 
it is a lot of money. Mm. And of course, we have a government. For example, as the professor was talking, I was like, okay, government can take different options, including, for example, cutting down on the number of presidential advisors. How much money do we spend? State House <laughs> spends. I've had some MPs saying they spend it, uh, two billion in a week. Maybe wow. I wish you would tell us what is the budget of State House per day, mm. per week, per month. This coming budget is about six six hundred and seventeen billion or something like that. Yes, That's for State House. So you can say that because the president has about. 120 30 advisors, presidential advisors. They are advising him on what? You can say that for this time. I need maybe 20 essential advisors. Mm. Let me shed off 100. And deputy are this is advisors. Mm. That would is the need for the 4.58 trillion taxes on essential commodities that are choking the citizen. So where would those you other would also advisors say, earn from? <laughs> what because they, to, we to, to the president, are we, what are to the president he argues that these that are a professional a, a, job? employment opportunities for, for the people. Mm -hmm. and what are we earning from? Is mm -hmm. that a profession? Did they go to school to study being advisors? Didn't you go to school? Mm -hmm. Did they study being advisors? Shut them off. You can say that I am cutting down my size of cabinet. Mm -hmm. 40. The constitution says 22. Why do you need 80 in a struggling economy? Can I give you some more contribution on the cutting down? Yes. You see, government officials spend on fuel, literal, when you compare to what they do from Monday to Friday, because they are driving just here in Kampala. Mm. Just say that no more government vehicle will be on the road from Friday evening until Monday morning. You know, because during the weekends is when they go to, see, to look at their farms at home. Using government vehicles. Government and vehicles fuel. and government fuel and the servicing is government. If you, 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 you cut off that, like in Tanzania at one time, I don't know whether they are doing it when I was there. Mm. No government vehicle would be seen on the road except security ones. Now, if you do that, you know how much money you will save. Mm. And therefore, it will cater for. The other tax reduction we have talked about continue. Yes. Say I am cutting down cabinet. 40. I'm reducing it by half. How much money would we save as a country? Wouldn't that take care of the 4.58 trillion taxes on essential goods in this budget? Look at the size of parliament. Mm. They don't even have where to sit. And I wouldn't be surprised if they create new constituencies. Because that is how NRM keeps in power. They elaborate patronage. If a constituency is problematic, it is occupied by opposition, divide it. There is no other driving principle. Divide it. We see which sub-counties support NRM. Go to the voting patterns. I think these two sub-counties voted for NRM. Let's create a constituency. Then NRM will retain the abnormal majority in parliament. Through which now you get money for, for your mass party billions when the others are getting the country a hundred million or so. So that's how NRM is keeping itself in power. Mm -hmm. A lot of money is spent on public administration. Half of it is useless. It's unnecessary. Mm -hmm. The president can do that. He can return his useless scandals towards the elections. After all, it is patronage and he wants votes. Mm -hmm. But now he can say for two years, these people have sent them off. I'm reducing the cost of public administration. He had that option. Mm -hmm. But can he do it? No. Mm -hmm. He's telling citizens to eat cassava. Mm -hmm. So can we see the budget of state house reducing by a half as they also consume cassava? And tighten their belts. And instead of using Why are you increasing? Bus, they should use what? Why are you increasing the budget of state house? Why are you telling people to eat cassava and tighten their belts on their hungry stomachs? Why don't you do the same? So he came to tell citizens that I know you are boiling. 
Mm. I know you are choking, but I must milk you further. You must feed my exaggerated, extravagant government. Was that a useless speech? Why did he waste people's time? Mm. Interesting. Uh, uh, <laughs> which I, I, I am sure you, you have uh, responses to make on that. And uh, part of uh, the, the, the proposals that are coming through, you've heard them. And uh, the president says uh, we have at least uh, 4.5 uh, billion US dollars in the reserves. But uh, yet we spend so much on public administration. Why not, like Sarah is saying, why not reduce on that? To add on the reserves to to allow for 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 these uh, subsidies, subsidies to be worked. Yes. Yeah, but uh, <clears throat> if you are saying you cut to put on reserve, mm. it is reserve. It won't still solve the problem. We are saying cut your expenditure, tighten your. Then put it on reserve. Because the worry is that but if if, if we make subsidies, the then the That's reserves would be there. yes. You can make you get money for as long the as you have and surplus. You you it, yes. Yes. You know, you okay, but, but let me say this. Uh, Sarah was questioning why the speech at all. Mm. Why the speech? When you are offered no, uh, no solution. Why the speech she is that... Some uh, people. That it's it, okay to boil. They, no, they frog to boil and die. No, that the spite of COVID was caused <laughs> by the opposition. <laughs> Just, let, let her find out which continue. <laughs> so why the speech? Why the speech is that... Uh, mm. Look, here is a president with the mandate of the people, the fountain of honor, who should give directions to the government, to the people. So keeping quiet would amount to not giving direction, mm. especially at a critical moment like this one. Mm. So that was one of the objectives, and it was achieved. That here, uh, you would come 40, out and just speak. So which the direction did people, they give? The 40 million people should know that you have a person, you have given a mandate, and is there to, 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 to inform us of how we are and where we are and give us the solution. So that provide solution. Mm. The other thing is that uh, you can judge the importance of this speech from the, the result. The result is that there's stability in the country. People got the explanation. They got convinced. There's peace. Have you had anybody saying uh, rioting somewhere? No. The idea of the speech was to give confidence and give stability, which was achieved. Uh, but uh, there is the, the message on the, on the, the streets. Of and course, many other of course people Bezge who have is come a out. political leader. I will always want to make a point. He's not an ordinary citizen. Besje, like opposition in parliament, even if you say I'm giving every Ugandan $10 million each, opposition will have something to say. So, you know, op op political leaders, you, you are not surprised. It's not news. In fact, I would, it would be news if they said nothing, it would be news if they did, did nothing. It is not news that political leaders say something. If however much you did, it is there. I could say profession in quotes and quotes. So that is not news. Now, uh, the other thing is that the president, of course, explained some silent issues. There are many silent issues. For example, our, our neighbors, Tanzania, Kenya, they are doing this. What about us? Those are silent issues that needed a leader to come out and explain. And he came out and explained it. So that is it. Now. Uh, the other comment the president made was that what the professor said that there are some factors which are internal and others are external. The external factor, the president made pronouncement about it. And many leaders fear now to make such pronouncement because you first want to hear which, what superpower is saying. But you saw the president came, coming out to tell the West that please solve that problem. In fact, he implied that it is them who are causing it. And by, by them coming out to talk to the West about this, is actually offering a solution to an internal challenges caused by external uh, problems. And he came out and he told the West, and many leaders, I repeat, would even be shy to make their position known at this time, or even would try to, to be on the wrong side. So he made his position known about that. And let me comment about the consumer law that the professor wanted it in place. Protection law. Uh, 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 consumer protection law. Law, yeah. Yeah, right now, I think we have a loose or a free movement of consumer association. And that would actually go ahead to show the pro-peopleness of the government, that the people are free to associate <clears throat> in a way that they wish. There's a consumer association. There's a consumer movement. But about an act of parliament, an act of parliament comes from the people. 
I personally or the party would have nothing wrong by anybody proposing a law in parliament, even if it meant a private member's law. Because not everything captures the mind of the government. And government tends to have priorities and debates, checks and balances. For example, we are going into, we have that liberal, neoliberalism that we are talking about. It, it can sway anybody's mind. But if the people so wish that they want an enactment in that direction, the power is with the people. And they are free to make even a private member's uh, motion. But for now, the government facilitates free, free association of the people. And there's a strong movement of consumer protection. So I don't know what they have done now. But the consumer protection movement is there. They have an association. They are protected. They are operational. If they wish to translate the it. association is not a movement. Yes. If they, they, if they want to <laughs> translate it and let their objective translate it into an act of parliament, they are free to do it. Hmm. So... In a nutshell, therefore, the president's speech gave direction. The president's speech gave confidence. Mm. And the product of that is that you can see real stability in the country. Of course, with the challenges that he gave in, that we have to address and will be addressed. Yeah, interesting. But you see, uh, the, in the other countries, where the, the fellow panelists have talked about this, that uh, the, the governments, say in Kenya, Tanzania, have come out to, to say, increase salaries of uh, the public servants to allow them the, 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 the power to purchase and, of course, to, do, to act as shock absorbers. We've not seen this in the country They're today. Increasing in for scientists, yeah. Why can't it be a, can't it be a, general, a general call? Actually, in the speech, most of the people speculatively will say, will say public servants, you should be happy about this. You know, there's a speech should should have some good news for you. There was some speculation, but we didn't hear that happen. Uh, you see, uh, we are practices with our neighbors, mm. and I think this is the second time that people alluded that the president would say something. The first one was when we had the caucus movement in Kololo, mm. and uh, the movement caucus, parliamentary caucus. People thought that we talk about what other because the state of the economy was part of what he said. Mm. And he didn't have enough time. He actually promised in Kololo that he would come back to the state of the on economy. Vich, and, not and, state and, of economy, uh, on, on the broker, Vinci. Uh, no, the, 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 there was a state of the economy, security, and the coffee thing. Mm -hmm. So in Kololo, he promised that I don't have enough time. It was getting dark. I was there myself. Mm -hmm. He said it's getting dark, and you people will stay very far. Uh, we can leave this thing now, I will come back to the economy. And that, should, that is what form this coming back now. So many people from Kololo had thought that he would talk about the increase of salary or even the, the subsidies that other neighbors are doing. Mm. But he made it clear, and I think I agreed with him. He said, if the other countries are doing it, time will prove. But cushioning now or subsidies now is an artificial solution that you would have like taken Panadol, but the pain is there. So it is counterproductive in many ways than one, like the taxes, the 500 billion that we talked about, but also it, it says it, 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 it depletes the resources. The fuel and all these items are consumed much faster and you actually end up having nothing in the country. So his restraint about the salary increase and his restraint about subsidies is really not a by the way. It is a considered opinion and we are yet to be proved wrong or right, considering the fact that our neighbors have done the opposite. But this is an informed decision taken. This is a considered opinion taken. Of course, knowing the pain that it is, but time will prove us who is right. But already remember Kenya had a regress. Kenya tried and again withdrew. I don't know whether they went back to it. So we have taken this decision. We are observing. Let's see. History will tell who is right. Interesting. Uh, I think uh, we need to have our short break from here. And uh, when we return, we need to dig deep into uh, this speech and also try to see what would have been the best solutions or what would have been the best ideas that uh, possibly uh, the, the, the government would adopt or what you th we think would be uh, something that we would work to cushion uh, the situation today. But uh, on the panel, I will, will come back and uh, have this conversation uh, proceed. But join the conversation is live on our YouTube page on uh, Civic Space TV. We on uh, Twitter, uh, the hashtag uh, chat show UG. 
on uh, also the civic space uh, TV hashtag. Uh, you could also be part of the conversation in there. Let's have your views, let's share your thoughts and it's for the good of the economy. We'll come back shortly. <laughs>
on a plan, the plan of government to be frugal. Mm. But instead, we see government increasing supplementary budgets and the new budgets, uh, buying this and buying this, building this, building this. Let government come up with a frugal plan, austerity measures. We call them, they call them technically. Mm. When the, you have the austerity measures, then we shall understand. But you cannot tell the citizens to be frugal and you are not frugal. Mm. That is the contradiction. I think that some people have been putting it uh, in, in these graphic terms that do not preach wine, uh, sorry, do not preach water as you take wine. Mm. Let government be, be frugal. Let them reduce on expenditure, unnecessary expenditure, maybe maintain the salaries and some few things. Then reduce on fuel. I have already told you, why should government officials be driving government cars, state cars, home every weekend to look at their animals and the, and the plants and the buildings? Mm. Why? Why do they use that a lot of money? But their citizens are annoyed. He said they are not on strike. They could get on strike. On the roads, something that annoys us as citizens, if they don't know, let government officials listen. We are annoyed by this hooting. You see, every other uh, few meters, there is a government vehicle hooting, bypassing, abusing using, the traffic. Abusing traffic mm -hmm. And that government vehicle has got police uh, protection guards in the vehicle. And then they have, there, is a, there are other escort ones. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many they are. And you meet them even going home on, uh, over the weekend, everywhere. Ooh! Now that is spending government Money. They seem and, to be on a rush to, to doing something. But, you know, uh, they have the <laughs> <laughs> uh, And you know the arrogance yeah, they, they have. They think yeah. they are the ones who are, who are, are going doing more things. To solve this. When I am rushing to go for a lecture, yes. I am going to, to provide the public good, mm. which is even timely. Because if you are supposed to go there at 10, it must be 10. But this fellow might be going to catch up with reading monitor. Mm. You go to these government officials and you enter. One time I asked, uh, uh, I was in a government office I don't want to mention, mm. and I, I wanted to see the minister of state, and uh, I asked the secretary to allow me in. No, he said he's busy. He said, what is he doing? Mm. He said he's busy. Mm. She blocked me. Mm. Sometimes I'm cantacalous. Mm. I just opened the door. Mm. And what did I find? Mm. The minister was reading a newspaper, and I wanted to see him over something very urgent. A state issue, by the way. And the, the secretary was buying me and saying he's busy. Actually, when I entered there, he said, I'm not busy. In mm -hmm. fact, I told him that he told me that you are busy. He said, no, I'm not busy. I'm actually reading a newspaper. But you know, they are, the, the secretaries are uh, instructed to follow those rigid mm -hmm. protocols of entering. Anyway, that's a little bit diverg diverging. I am saying... We do not have a frugal plan. By the way, when this government came into power, one of the legitimizing uh, uh, issue that was sold to Ugandans was that they were going to be frugal. Mm. That is when they were talking about buying uh, 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 chairs, furniture from, uh, from Gaise, uh, drinking from uh, a plastic cup of marijuana and things like that. Lauren. But yeah. now what do we see? conspicuous <laughs> spending. It's not even bourgeois. It is feudal. The, the mm. president the, 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 for the five car combo. Both in their private and public life. The way they are, they, they, they are exhuming those feudal tendencies, driving and not he, he, he want, he, he, you know, even a minister cannot open his door, he, the door of his car, they must open for him. That, that looks a simple thing, but it's very important. It shows that you are not modest. You know, and they have to buy Cars of uh, how many cc's? These cars which gas of fuel are like what? 400 million a car. You mean can't you drive the one of 200? And must you have very many of them? Look at MPs, the way they behave. You know, MPs uh, removed the, the tax on the allowances, whereas they are tax on allowances of other public <sighs> officials. Mm -hmm. They claim they are, their salary is tax. You see, the salary is a small component of the whole. Whereas as a public servants, now they are paid one package, you have medical allowance, you have transport allowance, you have housing allowance, all are consolidated and taxed. Mm. But for the MPs, you don't tax them. Now, 
a government which came on the principle of being progressive, including even progressive tax, mm. it would insist that those people must pay tax like everybody. Now, most of the tax that we pay here in Uganda is retrogressive. It is not progressive. Mm. And there is a lot of consumption of spending. And then let's go back even to the question of revenue authority. Revenue authority, Uganda Revenue Authority, if people didn't know, the public should know, is the worst performer in tax collection in the whole of East Africa. Should I repeat it? Uganda Revenue Authority is the worst performer because Kenya collects about 20 to 21% ratio of its GDP. Tanzania collects about 18%. Rwanda collects about 15%. Uganda has been collecting around 20%. But I saw in East Africa, I read yesterday, that it has come down even to 11%. That means we don't correct uh, tax as it should be. Mm -hmm. That is not that Ugandans are not burdened by the tax. No, that tax falls on a few. There are very many Ugandans, especially associated with the government, mm -hmm. who are exempted from paying tax or evade tax. I was talking to one businessman, he was an Indian, we were, teach, we were teaching together with his wife. He is now relocated to, 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 to Canada. One of the challenges he found in Uganda is that when you import goods and you don't see them going, they are not bought, mm. immediately you suspect that you are importing the same product that an NRM big wig is also importing. And he's avoiding tax, you are paying tax, and, you, and, he, and he undersells you. So there are very many officials who are avoiding tax. You can see some building here in Kampala, a building of 10 billion shillings or plus, but you ask how much that building, the owner of that building has paid to government, you will find you might find it is almost zero. Mm. Now there is a problem of tax administration, but there is also a problem of tax policy in this country. That's partly why our tax collection ratio to GDP is very low. In Uganda. By the way, at the risk of being unpopular with what I have said, many people do not know. Let me educate the, some people who may not know, but others know. Agriculture is said to be the backbone of this country. Yes, mm. it is a backbone in the sense that it employs the majority of the people in Uganda and it feeds us, so food security. But in terms of uh, contribution to the economy, technically, mm. it contributes only 22% compared to the other sectors of the economy. Mm -hmm. But that is not all. Agriculture contributes only 1% to revenue of the country, and mainly that is sugar, which is uh, already industry or something like that. So agriculture is exempted. My, I'm going to say this even if it sounds unpopular. I don't see why somebody who sells a lorry per month of matoke should not pay tax. There should be a threshold that if somebody is selling only 10 bunches, that one shouldn't pay tax. But you are selling two rollies and you don't pay tax. You come to the cows, they don't pay tax. Surely, somebody who has got 200, some people have 500, even exotic cows mm. in Uganda. A thousand. As a thousand. He doesn't pay a tax, a direct tax on that income. And they get a lot of income. Then you run after a civil servant who has earned 300,000 and you tax that person. Why well. don't we have... At what point should the cow pay tax? At sale? We get or at threshold. The Even the, the, the salary earners, mm -hmm. you don't... Uh, like if you're earning 50... Uh, you don't pay tax. Mm -hmm. You don't pay as you earn. You know that. Yes. So they put a threshold. Put a threshold that if you have 10 cows, don't pay the tax. But for heaven's sake, somebody is boasting of... 2,000 cows and you are not paying tax, that is where also we get it wrong. Mm. So I think we need to go back and see, then there is tax exemption, which is arbitrary. Whereas there can be tax exemption to uh, uh, attract uh, investors. To attract yeah. some. Yeah. Mm. It shouldn't be done arbitrarily. I am told, is it last year or, or the last how many years? We have missed tax correction through tax exemption by 5 trillion. Now it is seven. Five trillion. That is where we go wrong. And that's why the Revenue Authority is not 
correcting. Performing, yes. It is not performing like the others. Mm -hmm. There the, are very many challenges. There are tax policies which are uh, problematic, but there is also tax administration which is problematic. And that mm -hmm. is up to government. Let them get the right people in terms of tax administration and correction, but also let them have the right uh, tax, uh, uh, the, the right tax policies. Mm -hmm. You are going to tell me that uh, maybe uh, the revenue collection in Uganda is so low because we are far away from the cost. But Rwanda is far away from the cost. Mm -hmm. How come that Rwanda collects a bigger a ratio than Uganda. By the way, even on the question of fuel, you can imagine Rwanda is more landlocked than we are in the sense that they are far away. Some of their fuel comes uh, used to come so from, Uganda. Uh, from Uganda and go to Chigari and be cheaper than the one in Uganda because we collect more tax. Mm. So the problem is that the tax uh, burden in Uganda falls on a few people. Others avoid and evade the tax. And then there are foreigners who are exempted. And then there are those who actually, the tax havens, mm. there are those who end up registering their companies outside Uganda in tax havens. Their country is called tax havens. Mm. Those which, which don't, like Mauritius and others, which don't collect a lot of tax, they register there. So they, they, are, they, they, they register under double taxation agreement and they end up being taxed, they claim they are taxed, they are not taxed in Uganda. Mm. Let's close that double taxation argument. In respect of tax correction, which would uh, also have assisted us so that we have more, and we use that one also to subsidize some sectors in order to uh, ameliorate the challenges of this uh, uh, economic crisis, is that Uganda Revenue Authority has been poorly performing. So much so that Uganda Revenue Authority is the poorest revenue collection performer in the whole of East Africa, maybe minus Burundi, which is a basket case. So you find that Tanzania, uh, Tanzania collects about 18%, Kenya collects about 20 to 21%, uh, Rwanda 15% of ratio to GDP, and Uganda has been collecting around 12, it has now gone to 11%. Now, what is the challenge there? The challenge there is among other things uh, due to poor admi tax administration but also due to poor policy uh, tax policy which is a government thing not a revenue authority uh, there are very many foreigners foreign investors who are uh, tax exempted but there are also ugandans indigenous people mm. who are tax exempted on frimsy excuses and sometimes we don't know why they are exempted because it's not done on the principle Mm. Then there are certain products, I was saying that agriculture, for example, agriculture contributes in terms of sectors. We have the agriculture sector, the industrial sector, and services sector. Agriculture sector contributes only 22% to GDP in Uganda and contributes about 1% to tax revenue. Now, in respect of tax revenue, is that some sectors of agriculture should be Taxed. I am saying this at the risk of being sounding unpopular, but I don't see why somebody who sells a whole roll of matoke every month shouldn't be taxed. And you tax a civil servant who earns 300,000 per month. I think we need to have a, a threshold upon which even agriculture sector should be taxed. Mm. Look at somebody who has got 200 cows. Why shouldn't that person be taxed? And why shouldn't milk even be taxed? We can also use the threshold and say, when you have only 10 cows, for example, you shouldn't be taxed like a civil servant who earns uh, 150,000 uh, per month is not taxed. Mm -hmm. We have a threshold even in the agricultural sector. But you have got a whole swamp of rice. Or in northern Uganda, there are people who have got hectares and hectares of rice, of rice grown. Mm. And you are not taxed at all. We need to have the tax burden equitably distributed among Ugandans. And through that, if, for example, our tax base was, uh, was widened, not only deepened, because deepening falls on a few people. We widen the tax base and we get more. So if we would get more, then we would get even more now to subsidize certain uh, 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 certain sectors that 
uh, basic sectors which contribute to the basic necessities of life by way either of subsidizing or which is also a form of subsidy or by reducing tax on certain strategic basic goods so that we can survive in this life people say we are surviving we are actually nearly surviving we are not living mm. that's very unfortunate mm. and professor, that's why people are even mad professor how many how many percentage of uh, uh, our population is is uh, is employed in, in agriculture uh, it is, Do you have any statistics? It is that? likely to be around 70 to 75%. Mm. They are employed there, but still, in terms of contribution to GDP, mm. it is very low because, first of all, agriculture is not a very much productive enterprise. Could it be the fallback of government to say that uh, now we don't tax, uh, for example, agricultural producers, and uh, then we uh, could be the smooth way of saying, uh, the smooth runway of saying that, okay, at least we are not on on a, a, a brink of, of of collapsing because then people are really surviving. They are having their no, meals at the cheap. They are having their, their 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 products they produce at home correct, and they can correct, easily survive. Correct, correction, I don't here, know. Yes. correction here. Even today, agriculture is not taxed. Hmm. In Uganda, a very few areas like those industrial products, like you have tea and the co and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and 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 the sugar. Mm. Uh, by and large, agriculture is not taxed, is an area which is not taxed. So I am saying, yes, let the peasants, the poor people, mm. but the commercial farmers should be taxed. Mm. We have to democratize taxing. We have to widen the tax base so that it doesn't fall on a few people. And I, even think, I think in Uganda, the biggest people who, who act like the in agriculture are the middlemen. The real farmers don't benefit from agriculture. Well, that is a different mm. policy issue. Mm. But uh, those middle, uh, uh, the, 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 the farmer who produces, uh, who has got 200 cows, one mm. way or the other is also benefiting. You mm. cannot say he's not benefiting. That's why you see they are building a house of 400 million. Mm. He must be earning one way or the other. What about somebody who earns 300,000 and is paying pay as you earn? Mm. That's the one who is earning a salary of 300,000 is much, much, much poorer than somebody who, has, who sells a lot of matoke or has got rice fields. He comes from northern Uganda. He can tell you, some people now in northern Uganda, like the mm. region, they are growing rice in, in, in hectares and hectares. Mm. And those ones, you just don't tax them, but you run after somebody who is earning a mitwara asatu. That is not being fair. So our taxation system is not fair, mm. and partly that explains why our total uh, uh, revenue collection ratio to GDP is the lowest in the region. Mm. Not because Ugandans are not taxed heavily. They, they are very few who are taxed heavily. You may find actually they are taxing about 1 million people. Mm. The rest are not taxed. And then this is not talk about tax exemption. Tax exemption, when we talk about tax exemption, many people think that it is only foreigners. We have got locals who are well connected with government, who evade tax, or even a tax exempted and tax ends up falling on tax is even used I'm, so, I'm told as a political instrument mm. if you are opposition they will follow you up and tax you to the last mm. when you are pro the regime and you normally contribute during elections mm. they will turn a blind eye to you mm. and this is historical some of you are young maybe I don't know for him but when NRM had come into power it had a company which was doing business. Danze. Danze. It was called Danze. That company was found to be evading tax. It was avoiding tax. It was not paying tax. It was caught red-handed. Red-handed, that was a government company. Doing what? Dealing in what? It was uh, importing. Even it was in a business. All types of business. And it was avoiding tax. Mm. It was, is it avoiding or evading? Both evading. of them. Mm. It was called. Then they decided to keep quiet about it. Of course, finally, it was disbanded, but they kept quiet about it. <coughs> the point I'm making is that the intention of evading tax was there. Because if it was not there, even the company heads and whatever would have been punished. They were not punished. Mm -hmm. so that means we have to do something about taxation in order to get money that would be used for subsidizing basic commodities for the majority of Ugandans. But what I see is now that the regime 
is just after the market, pro market, pro capital, not pro labor, not pro the, 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 the poor. And we have got a lot of inequalities in Uganda by the inequality levels. Wealth inequality in Uganda is increasing by the day. Hmm. Did you know, by the way, that we are talking about a uh, uh, middle income status, that Uganda has not yet attained a middle income status? Hmm. That's about 1,036 US dollars. Did you know, listeners and those of my colleagues who are here, that some regions of Uganda are already in the middle income status? Central Uganda and Western Uganda are already in middle income status when you calculate. It is northern, uh, northern Uganda and Eastern Uganda which are pre-middle income status. Our, what affirmative action are we doing to make sure that Eastern Uganda and Northern Uganda also come to the middle income status? Mm. Unless we do that, we cannot say we are pro-people. Interesting. Actually, there is a comment that is making rounds on social media that those that can afford fuel going back and home are actually in, in the middle income status. <laughs> this is, this is, it's a screenshot making rounds. But Sarah, I, Sarah, I, Sarah <laughs> in the middle income. Maybe, Sarah, maybe I would want to, to it's, it's a lifestyle question. Uh, professor talks about uh, taxing agriculture, but also importantly. Today, Not the whole of it. Yes. But, uh, threshold. It's, it's, okay, a threshold of it. But uh, could that be the reason? Because if we have over about 70% of our population in agriculture, it's not taxed, and most of the people are actually affording a meal as little in a day is it the reason why as a people as a population we are comfortable even with the biting economic crisis that you we know, that we are just we as we anything that is, is just passing us events are passing us and we're not bothered ugandans are peaceful people mm -hmm. but also passive mm. peaceful because as a nation, we have been battered. Since independence, I don't know why we get the mad people in power. I know that the report has said that about 14 million Ugandans are mad, but most of these people are in public offices. Maybe we need to start testing people who are vying for leadership, for, for a mental checkup. They could be those. Yes, because. <laughs> <laughs> the government needs to be yes, checked here. Yes, because they are supposed to take very important decisions mm -hmm. that affect everybody. So maybe we should put it as part of the qualifications. Because you don't know where are these 14 million people. And how come, since independence, we have failed to resolve a question of a people-centered leadership? Yeah. I know NRM claims to be that, but they do the opposite. People Talk is cheap. Anybody can say anything. But actions speak louder than words. Mm -hmm. What actions do you do? <clears throat> I know that there are key, two, key, two key words that the president used in that speech. Mm -hmm. speech. Reactionary and revolutionary. He even added that the revolutionary are on the way to heaven and the reactionary are on the way to hell. Gehenna. Which he called Gehenna. Yeah, that is our local word mm -hmm. for hell. So who are these people on the, on the way to hell? Reactionary. Yes, and they are in public offices. They are in public offices. What is the evidence? You look at the actions of government. Mm. You come out of a COVID lockdown situation and appoint 80-man cabinet. Are they going to have the country to carry it on their heads? You come out of COVID economic contraction and you are creating states. Mm. You are creating municipalities. That, that is increasing the burden. These municipalities were created in 2020. COVID had broke out. We all knew the projections of COVID over the economy. Mm. You have a two year lockdown and you have people sleeping and falling in parliament. Some of the senior ministers falling. I'm not saying falling sick is a, a problem, but what is their age and where are they supposed to be? At nine, where what are you supposed to be doing? Are you the one to run around and fetch water at nine? 
Irish <laughs> man, which is looking at me. These are people, if you need to give them a retirement package, please give it to them. They are beyond working age. They are beyond productivity. So the, the, the conduct of government is reactionary and is on the way to gain for this country. Nijak. Yes, we all knew the projections, economic projections, if around the Ukraine war. What were we faced with as a new government, regardless of the situation, of course, of a permanent incumbency? Mm. 2021, this country was supposed to get a new government. I know that theirs is more of the same, no change, that is their slogan. But a new government, out of COVID pandemic, out of lockdowns, out of need to refocus and rebuild the economy, what is your conduct? It is reactionary. It is gain. Half of the money goes into administration. What is our productivity? All projects of government are on loans and, and, and grants. You have a 48.1 trillion budget. At most, you project 25 trillion. So you are going to borrow 23? 25 trillion correction. Yes, but of course it won't happen. Because out of the rising cost of living, mm -hmm. even if you refuse to subsidize the economy, you will make more revenue shortfall than countries that are subsidizing the economy. Mm -hmm. Developed countries focus on purchasing power to increase tax revenue. Mm -hmm. Once the people are not consuming, you have nothing to tax. Majority of our taxes are indirect. Mm -hmm. I agree with the submissions of Professor Ndebesa on direct taxation. But the majority of our other taxes are indirect. As you consume, you are paying tax. Mm -hmm. It's consumption tax, which is unprogressive. Yes. So when the people are not consuming, then you have no revenue to generate. Mm -hmm. There is a tax on soap. There is, I mean, essential commodities. The total tax projection is almost $5 trillion. So if I say in my house we are going to wash once a week instead of every day, so a bar of soap is going to last a month, aren't you making revenue shortfall on my reduced consumption of soap? So government is going to make more revenue shortfall than the 4.5 trillion that they are refusing to reduce by a third to subsidize the cost of living in this country. And it does not make sense. Interestingly, in his, uh, in his summary, he said that, uh, and he made it the second uh, point, that the correct action is to kukekeleza, being frugal. Yes. How is it kukekeleza on his consumption? Get, get alternatives for, for, for example. I, I want to come to the issue of productivity. He said mm. he's going to do substitute the, the high cost of importation mm. of essential commodities. One of the items on the table is sunflower and, and castor oil, which he mentions mm. in that speech. But when you go to the petty project of government in this financial year, the parish development model mentions 14 priority products. Sunflower and castor oil are not part of those products. And the focus of government on productivity are on the parish model. If there is any other method, I, I, I challenge my co-panelists to mention it. So the ones in the speech are not in the budget. So how are you going to, 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 increase, to increase their productivity? Yeah, their production, actually. In Uganda productivity is decreasing at a higher rate, not production. But also, yes, and, and as, as I conclude on this segment, the structure of the economy, building on what the professor has said, you know the structure of the economy is gauged on three indicators, a productive or progressive economy. One is ability to increase local production. Second is employment. And third is competitiveness. When you go to the structure of Uganda's economy, 24.2% is agriculture, mm -hmm. about 25% is industry, and 50.2% is, is services. Who controls the bulk 
of services is the question and what services mm. are we producing as a country that includes the likes of MTN, like Sovia there and, and, and the hotel banks. industry, the banks, where we have a very little proportion. I think we are remaining with three local banks. Which one? Indigenous mm -hmm. banks, Centenary Bank. No, because Centenary Bank, the biggest share is now foreign. Okay. Then housing finance and micro, um, pride microfinance. Those are the only indigenous banks now operational in Uganda. Mm -hmm. You have 39% mm -hmm. as per the statement of Bank of Uganda yesterday. 39% of Ugandans are still outside the money economy, but I know that they are, there could be more than the figure that the bank was giving. The re recent state of the economy report, we have inequalities to the coefficient figure of 0 0.41. That is 41% of, of the population living under in, in income inequalities. Also, the recent report showed that 1% of Ugandans earn above 1 million shillings. Mm -hmm. I am not, I don't know whether I'm in the middle income class or not, but I can assure you that 1 million Ugandan shillings, <laughs> today when you go, if you were around a month, about 600,000. 600,000. Mm -hmm. And this has nothing to do with the middle income. That, that is a small car. Mm. 600,000, if you don't spend it on fuel, you will spend it on public transport, mm. going and coming to work. We have done these calculations at office. Average staff spend 500,000 on transport, public. Mm. And, and we are considering shutting down and working at half capacity because people must remain with money to, 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 to afford essentials. Mm. So if this is the situation Ugandans are faced with, if I cut down on my movements and I say I will move on Friday when I need to record, to participate in the rec recording of this show, I'm going to work from home. I can only spend 50,000 on internet mm -hmm. because a band of 50,000 on any either of the providers is enough for you to work online and we've tested this through lockdowns. So if we re ignite the, the, the infrastructure we used during lockdown to keep working and cut down on fuel, cut down on movement, including public transport, cut down on expenditures of soap and arrest, mm -hmm. where is the government going to get to the tax? Those are automatic crosses that the government is going to, to get in revenue collection. Yeah. And how are you going to fill that gap? Boro. Interesting. I, uh, upon that which I see you've been taking notes, and uh, I just want to, to invite you to make some uh, responses on what has been uh, advanced so far by your fellow panelists. Yes, uh, one thing is I want to comment about substitution. Mm -hmm. uh, you recall, you, we all know we are discussing the president's speech. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the, president is, the president is saying that uh, if we have been relying on things from abroad, we can actually have things which satisfies the same need, mm -hmm. but local. And I think uh, the people's mind rush into the cassava example to bread because it is sounded rude maybe to some people. But the beauty of the cassava example is that the president himself does not eat bread. He eats cassava. Out of privilege. So, it is not a condition. Yeah. So if it he was... Not that it's he a choice. Bread. It's not that yes. he cannot that afford bread. So you but, need to add that, that, that it is by is choice. That it would be unfortunate if he told people to eat cassava and he doesn't eat. He eats but it he by eats choice. It and he doesn't eat bread. Now, but that is just one case of substitution. If you look at the... And say, a colleague the other time mentioned here, if you went into, if you went into supermarkets now, increasingly we have items made in Uganda, very many, including juices, the drinks, and all this and all that. So there are many, and therefore we should promote that instead of spending money to import them from abroad. Uh, so that is what is substitution. The issue is maybe how many people can afford what is being produced. Yeah, so but far. the same people could afford the ones being imported. 
So the same people who are consuming the one being consuming one being imported, mm. now we are saying you can actually consume what we are producing. How many and people, course, how many people mm. in the government buy their clothes from ginger? Ninety. Well, that, that may be not one of the eight areas of, con I mean, uh, substitution. But <laughs> a big <laughs> but they are promoting the bubu. In fact, a nitel gets more, more income than other. Of course. In Why? Nitel supplies the whole of police, the whole of UPDF, the whole of other uh, forces. They sell, sell a lot. If we go to so, cabinet, how yeah. many people would you see them but, putting but the on night in produce? Cabinet is 0.0, .0 something percent of the No, population. they are giving us an example. So, uh, policies if, come from if, them. For example, we were living, a, we meaning we, government was leaving the uniform for police, the uniform for the army, and all these were importing. We would say, hey, this is a lot of money you're importing. Like in the past, we, the government of Uganda used to import uniforms from Franklin. Hmm. Franklin, but Franklin is a big manufacturer company. Mr. Moderator, can hmm. we do a sample here hmm. on the show? Hmm. How many of us are putting on Ugandan produced goods? None of us, man. <laughs> okay, but this is a small percentage. So what I was saying, the substitute <laughs> is there. Space. This, but me, I'm putting on from Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> My suit is from Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> you bought it in Kampala. Right. You bought it in Kampala. My suit is Uganda. from Uganda. You show us from your foreign and see where it is. My suit is from Uganda. Now, that is, I want to say about some things. And of course, yeah. the policy pay position of buy Uganda, uh, build Uganda. Uganda. Mm. So that is about the substitution that I wanted. And by the way, we are making mm. a lot of issue about the cassava <laughs> bread issue. Do you know bread actually in the Luo is corn? Corn in the Luo, bread is made from millet. Mm. The same bread that Europeans make from wheat or Middle East. We make so whatever we are, you make we and substitute with here. bread, it's, not... it's bread. It is corn. Or you, would you wish to call it a mere or something here? But we, it is relative and circumstantial according to the condition. Mm. So we can make bread for us in the north. Our corn is from millet, which is bread in other jurisdictions. You, you are people in the north travel in pickups. Why don't people in state house travel in pickups? No, that's another issue. Now, I, I wanted to make that. Now, uh, the other comment I want to make is a, Professor makes mm. a lot of comments about taxation. Mm. I would want a discussion. Taxing cows. I would want a discussion where a professor make abuses facts because most of the talk that he gave border speculation no and without data for example mm. if you say an indian says when your goods are not bought then the presumption is that an nrm person has important yes and so many of those those are really i will mention to you some of those people when we are out of the so we should uh, talk here. things actually there's also facts. an interesting article mm. that came out in the monitor or something that uh if you're doing all legitimate business, so if your business really uh, flourishes in, in Uganda here, mm. then you must be a thief or something. Those are no? talks of speculation, I'm saying, <laughs> including saying so many of these because people are not taxed and the other one are evading. We must come out with facts and figures about this. So I just wanted to comment about mm. speculative ideas surrounding taxation. The other thing is about uh, tax exemption. The law is very elaborate about tax exemption. It is very, very clear. So whoever wants to benefit from taxes, he can even make a claim if he feels it's untaxed unfairly. So the tax regime is governed by law, and all businessmen and actors in these countries are presumed to know. Or if you don't know, they are tax consultants or even lawyers. So the law is clear. If somebody feels he, a, a foreigner, foreigner, for example, is exempted, and he, Ugandan, is supposed to benefit, is not exempted. He has a right because the law is there to caters for all of us. So let's take advantage of the legal provision in the country and make sure we, 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 we benefit. What, yeah. what are the conditions for benefiting from the presidential grace? Because uh, outside the taxation regime and exemptions mm -hmm. and after the challenges face, faced by Enrica and Vinci Kofi, finance has come up with something known as ex presidential grace. Mm. to give exemptions that oh. are not mentioned in law. 
Okay, I'll address that, but I wish is, they is had come from for, the moderator. Is that let, 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 for? let me first <laughs> make my I'm submission giving him to avoid di diversion. The other thing I want to talk is about is on, uh, no tax on agriculture. <laughs> uh, no tax or tax on agriculture, like Professor says. Uh, I get the professor's concern that uh, if somebody has 200 heads of cows, mm. oh, why wouldn't he? Uh, I think the tax regime now is that there's exemption or there's no tax on agriculture. But be as it is, mm. prof professor is a professor of history. We are not living in a, a, hard, and, a hard and frozen static society. Society is dynamic. If views start coming like that, it's okay. It's the professor's view and maybe other people's views. It can be discussed. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that if yesterday there's no tax on this, then tomorrow and the next day. No, we live in a dynamic society. But the other aspect of non-taxation on agriculture is that we have had food. We have food. We are, people are not dying of famine. Uh, maybe in exceptional situation where there's the climate has affected the farmers. Maybe this is the incentives that has led to the food basket that we are. But all in all, I'm saying new ideas which come up, including the professors, we don't live in a static and a fixed society. It should be discussed. I know for a fact that at some point maybe it was discussed and that is why the law was as it is. But laws are amended and revisited. Mm -hmm. If that is a, the idea, then it is on the table. I have no, I, no problem. I don't think government has any problem about that with discussing ideas that come on the table. It has a problem. Now, I will talk about it last day. Yeah. Now, about pro-peopleness. Uh, professor kept questioning about the pro-peopleness. Since the NRM came into power, yeah. when he was in Tanzania, uh, I, I know that uh, the idea was felt to Professor. I, I, I happen to have been those who came with NRM to power, so I'm privy to all the ideas. And you said in Tanzania that uh, you had a good idea. I mean, it would reach you in good faith, in good time, and it sounded very well. You and Mishambi. I know Mishambi also came in. By the way, Mishambi. Uh, the pro-people government had this voice and Uganda Airlines was then there. Mishambi, they sent a whole airline to bring one person. Uganda, Uganda Airlines was sent, a plane was dispatched to, to Dar es Salaam to bring Mishambi because they thought it was really that problem. And he came and put in his, he became a director at the secretary, like I am. You remember? No, it was didn't. to repatriate him. The plan was to repatriate him. But he was briefly a director at the end, which was in post office building here. I don't know about that. He was. So, uh, Michelle, they dispatched a whole airplane to To repatriate him. him. Yes. Because it it was wasn't that yeah. wasted. That was no, wasted. No, it wasn't wasted what? because he had the revolution. That is evidence that of won. wasted. So now, <laughs> why wasn't it sent to me? <laughs> you had not come out clear. You think I'm reactionary? You had not come out clear. <laughs> no, but the point here is, what are we talking about? This pro peopleness. The pro peopleness is manifested in several ways. One is that decision making systems mm. are taken to the people. We have had, by law, and in law, decisions, governments are devolved up to local council. Three, we have made a strong, effective LC local council systems. Village decisions are had. District, uh, uh, local district council, three is a government which can sue, can be sued. We have made all these systems in devolution of power. That is one aspect of a pro-peopleness. The other aspect is that by and far in decision making, you get the feelings, the aspirations of the people. Professor may want to know how is the measurement of the feeling of uh, aspirations of the people. How do we know we have felt? But we listen. And the, the other aspect is a regular free and fair election. <laughs> These are the pro people. <laughs> These are ingredients <laughs> you have been from, the, the, from the government, for the last from the formation years. of governments, <laughs> and also the pro peopleness is that we, know, we, know we have. <laughs> Professor, I'm showing you the ingredients of them because you have kept I'm on hearing. questioning. I'm you hearing. have kept on questioning the pro peopleness. We have <laughs> the youth bodies right from the village youth council, all through to national. We have the elderly right from the village up to the national. 
We have the disabled. We have the women. We have all this. These are units or, or ingredients to capture the pro peopleness. So it's not a, not only in rhetoric, but it is in the policy framework, the aspirations, the devolution of power to the people, free and fair, regular election. Remember, it is fair. It can never be perfect. So, Professor, I like to assert that the pro peopleness of NRM has not changed. What and is, what it is will the continue. definition of fair? Capital. You have had the aspect of capital vis-a-vis -vis labor. I have the same concern because the literature that I'm exposed to, I'm totally conscious about that. But by and far, this is the ingredient of the pro peopleness of NRM. Okay, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, the panelists will have to respond to you. But uh, getting into into the the economics itself, uh, Sarah, you 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 quoted somewhere saying that uh, while you the government and, and the president is telling us to tighten our belts you ask that uh, they should tighten their bills first. And they have big stomachs. <laughs> they buy for them I don't know which, which size of yeah. belts would go to <laughs> them. But uh, interesting is that uh, we're, in, <laughs> we're, in the budget, we're in the budget process. So I wanted to find out, really. It has been passed. It, it has been passed, mm. yes. But does it really uh, respond to, to the economic uh, situation today? Or will it really, no, really no, respond No, it doesn't. To... First of all, mm. A budget has shortfalls with the law itself. Mm. There are two elements of non-compliance with the Public Finance Management Act, where our government was unable to indicate trends, forecasts for economic trends. Mm. So it means that they also don't know the projection of the economy. Mm. Yet that is a, a required under Section 13. 13.1a of, of the Act, they also failed to indicate possible liabilities under the same section, subsection 9, section 13, and they, they are contradictions with each other on the, on the public debt, which mm -hmm. is now at 53.1, yet the projection for this year was 52.4. And the projection is 55.4, which is way mm. outside the projections in the in the Charter for Fiscal Responsibility. But beyond that, the, the budget has a focus of reviving the economy out of COVID, but also fighting inequalities, the, the income inequalities, mm. and access to health and education as a key focus. But under the programming budget for the human capital development, where health, education, social protection, and, and labor are all bundled together, mm -hmm. the, the divisions of the money don't rhythm with the objectives and focus of the budget and priorities. But also when you go into spending 31% of projected revenue collection on debt, debt servicing, debt. and it's important for Ugandans to keep remembering that NRM regime has benefited from total debt cancellation twice by international lenders. Debt cancellation twice, but we are now way above yeah, the red sure. line for, for, for public debt. And we are borrowing to do what? Buy vehicles for full figure, buy 500 million vehicles for whatever this other one. Butcherman. So, advisors. Aradises and yes, Aradises. Yes, 500 million. So when the president says, I will lose 500 billion, the question would be, what does he do with that money? And just recently he sent NRM money to his NRM office in, in the prime minister's district. Kakumiro. Abuse. Lack of fiscal discipline. Lack of proper planning. Mm. I don't know what to call it. A budget is passed. Within one month of passing a budget, you will see supplementary budget. Mm. And the money they are going to distribute among themselves is for borrowing. You know, we have for long been on the, on the rhetoric of an artificial economy. 
Uh, and, 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 and unfortunately, of course, to see prosperous in courts, prosperous business people like Tature struggling with whatever is going on in the media. But I was very disappointed when his name also appeared for the bay routes out of the, the, the 2016 elections. Mm -hmm. So we have these artificial regime billionaires who are inside horror. And that is symbolic mm -hmm. of a horror economy that you've been telling Ugandans about as you do self-enrichment and appeasement of ta on taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. So, in effect, Ugandans should ask the hard questions on what is the structure of this economy? What is it? Interesting. Can I which tell us what is the structure of this economy? Mm. Maybe I would want to invite him, Professor. On structure? No. Uh, we, <laughs> we, uh, our, our poverty, I think the percentage was about uh, 29% now, as of, uh, I think, 29%. Uh, projection now currently. The what? Poverty, Poverty rates. rates. Yes. Yes. And the, now that the budget has been passed, is do we think do you think that you possibly would would uh, have to revert this? Let me talk in the general things. Hmm. Uh, first of all, uh, which says that uh, our views are uh, invited. First of all, in the president's speech, he brought back the question of the correct line and the wrong line. Hmm. Gehenna. Gehenna. Mm. Now, if somebody presumes ignorance on you before he even exchanges with you, then he will not listen to you. Mm. He will hear you, but he will not listen. So the, the, there are people in Uganda who are presumed to have a correct line by nature. Mm. I don't know. And that I don't know whether that is materialism. That, that the, you presume that she has, she's reactionary. I'm reactionary, and by you, you are progressive. And revolutionary. And therefore, you see, talking in those absolute terms, by the way, well, maybe it is politicians between the academics, you don't just do that. You don't just presume ignorance on others, and for you, you are always right, by the way. From the time immemorial, you are right, and you will always be right, and others are wrong, and they will always be wrong. The correct and, 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 and the wrong line. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that one will progress, will make this country contribute ideas together and move forward. Talking about the, the budget. The budget, especially, let's say, look at in, in relation to development, mm. uh, uh, investment in economic development and whatever. First of all, you need to first sit back and say, which sectors have higher returns? And you prioritize those ones. When you find that sector has higher return, you invest in that one. Mm. So far, research has established that research and development has higher returns than other investment. Mm. Now, how much money has been invested in research and development in this, in, in this last budget? Because if Kawanda comes up with a variety, a good variety that is either faster growing or resistant to disease or resistant to drought, it will, it will create a higher return from the from the, the, the peasants than these other monies that are being thrown around for eating. Mm. So we have to look for areas that have got higher returns and invest in those. And we don't have to spread money thinly on the ground. For example, this uh, parish development model. We are going to spend money thinly on the ground throughout the country. Just 100 million. Most of these vehicles you see being driven by government officials are 400 million. Now you are saying that in a parish you are going to send there only 100 million. That cannot even construct a dam. Mm -hmm. And yet you are going to spread it again thinly. But of course and it makes say that's the middle. But of course it makes political sense in the terms middle. of higher returns in political support. Mm -hmm. But does it make sense in in economic logic. Mm. Let's for economic logic and leave the political logic for somehow. Somehow. Mm. So spreading money thinly, we have spread it thinly on the ground, the Mioga, I don't know, Bonava Gagarwari, whatever. That was spending money thinly on the ground. Mm. But I've just said that you cannot digest the whole budget in this short time 
but research and development would bring in higher returns and it has demonstrated globally that it brings in higher returns mm. research and development whether it is in agriculture whether it is even in innovation i wish that money that has been taken to the parish development model would have even been taken to every district in uganda every uh, district headquarters or district uh, headquarter uh, town you, you you build their innovation centers provide cheap internet in those areas so that these youngsters and you have a broadband improved and these youngsters play around with it i tell you the the, the current times are knowledge age times mm -hmm. they are not grow, growing more coffee and growing more beans and growing more, more maize mm -hmm. somebody comes up with one chip mm -hmm. one discovery and registers it even he can pay the taxes of the whole of Uganda combined. Mm -hmm. Just that one person. That's why the, the likes of Zuckerberg, the other time he sold the Facebook at 400, uh, at 40 million dollars. The, the, the mm -hmm. GDP of Uganda, mm -hmm. billion dollars. Mm -hmm. The GDP of Uganda combined is about 36 billion. So Zuckerberg, that young man, only one company, Facebook, has a turnover which is much more than the whole economy of Uganda combined. And, and where did he make that money? Digital. Mm. How do you go digital economy? Digital economy sending satellites in. By the way, Uganda is sending a satellite. I don't know where they are getting money. Mm. They, they are promised that they are sending a satellite to, 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 to space this year, 2022. Mm. It was planned. I don't know where they are getting that money, mm. but it is in plan. So anyway, I am saying innovation, innovation centers to have a creative economy in this country would spur development as we also, of course, support agriculture somehow, mainly for uh, food security and some surplus export. Uh, but in the 21st century that you go more to the parish to grow more beans and you think you'll compete in the whole world without having innovation centers for IT, is a challenge. I wish they, 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 they Professor, in your, in your, in your final remarks, I just want to, because our time is fast spent, mm -hmm. our producers are, are, are alerted us, we just need to give us a way forward for, for the economy where we are. No, we have people. talked about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I am not going to give the way forward for the economy per se, mm -hmm. but I'm going to give this one way forward, which I've just been commenting upon. Mm -hmm. Unless government drops the correct line mm -hmm. issue and brings many people on board, to dialogue about the way forward, mm -hmm. we are not going very far. That's one. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of a correct economy, you know, when this government came into power, it had a correct co economy. Mm -hmm. It had a correct line. Uh, 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 you know, mm -hmm. they came with a correct line. Uganda was a least developed country when government came into in power. Today it is a least developed country. Mm -hmm. When they come into power, Uganda was basically an agrarian mm -hmm. agricultural economy. Today, Uganda is still an agrarian agricultural economy. Mm. The, 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 the peasant community, we are talking about social economic transformation. The Uganda was basically a peasant society. It is still a peasant society. And we are not saying that all, any of us has got a miracle, can provide a miracle. But we are saying, let's drop the idea of a correct line, have shared ideas, and plan and see how this economy can move forward. That's one two. If we want to claim and practice pro people, mm. a majority of people that is, because even the rich or the elites are also uh, people, let us have a turnaround in our normative framework, in our attitudes, in our norms, and really not rhetorically, not lip service. Mm. And we invest money and we budget in a, such a manner that we reduce on conspicuous spending, conspicuous consumption of government, and invest money in the public sector, which will benefit many. I don't believe in giving money to individuals. Mm. I believe in public sector investment, yes, like water for agriculture. That money that is sent at the parish level in certain parishes where they don't have enough water, how the 100 million and provide water for the people then or or or, or, or construct uh stores for them 
or some other thing that can add value to their produce. This business of giving somebody 100,000, it makes sense in vote return. Does it make sense in economic returns? That's interesting. Uh, that's a good way to end. Uh, Sarah, your final take on this? Nobody can develop on borrowing. We have a country that came to power, a regime that came to power preaching a self-sustaining economy. Independent. Independent self-sustaining economy. As we talk today, integrated. we have 73.3 trillion and shillings in our debt, public debt portfolio. We have money in domestic areas that are constraining the private sector, that are constraining the, 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 the private productivity of individuals in the free market. And we have increasing poverty, increasing inequality, increasing public interest loans, and reducing purchasing power of the people. Mm -hmm. But in a rhetoric form, leaders have no shame in taking to the podium and telling people that we are progressing without specifying who is progressing. We know that the people who feast on taxpayers' money are progressing, but an ordinary citizen is struggling, is choking on the conditions of living. We need an economy that works for the people. Yeah. We need fiscal responsibility by the people that occupy public offices. And, this and we need productivity for the ordinary person. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, uh, to the government. Which part? Um, one is that I have heard the views of professor on the issue of the thin distribution of money on the ground. That is his view. But I believe and I know that before this parish model came up, a lot of research and consultation was done. And even if you gave 100,000 to a person in the village to help him to pay labor for those who are producing his simsim, cultivating simsim, and weeding his simsim and harvesting, and he gets uh, 500 kilos of simsim or so, that is the target. The parish model is meant for to the local person down there. So that is the view. But I get professor's view, but this is a consultation and what came up with. So if we help that person to produce his 400 bags of How they they consult? The people. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so this is the position of Paris model and we're rolling it out and the fruits will come and possibly when the fruits come, the professor will say, oh, you people were right. So that is it. Now, I the other thing I want to talk about is uh, the professor makes strong arguments about uh, the, 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 the preconceived idea of uh, a correct, correct line, line, people with a correct line vis a vis the wrong line. Mm -hmm. But you, I think you that's. You need should, to use, like, mm -hmm. summarize fast in about one minute. So yeah. that's all. No, yeah. what I'm saying is that that is about the methods of work of NRM. The mm -hmm. methods of work is that NRM believes in objectivity. Don't worry, you can be hard. Mm. Many members made views about graduated tax. They were hard, and we know where it is. So it is not for concluded that you are in the wrong line, no. The other thing is, uh, we are saying Uganda came in the Agarian 34, 35 years ago, and still the same. But it's, again, it is the same professor who mentioned that some areas, Western and Central, are already in middle income. So isn't that a contradiction? They could have finally, been a middle income then. Finally, what I'm saying is that the issue today is a president's speech. The president gave a speech. He explained the state of the economy. He gave guidance to the economy. And the product of the speech is that we have stability. People came to understand. And I think let's wait Was for the driver. Is the driver. And let's wait for what next course of action it will take. Because every development is being taken note of, and if there's need for flexibility, something will be done. But so far, so good. Yeah, thank you very much. Was uh, there instability before the speech? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I thank you very much, uh, uh, Nugawich, and also, no, importantly, right. is uh, thank you very much to 
<laughs> my panelists, uh, almost my regular panelists uh, who are always with us here, uh, 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 Professor Sarah and uh, Awich, uh, thank you very much, our dear viewers, uh, for always uh, being part of these conversations. And please uh, tune in to next week. We'll be back uh, and uh, on another topical issue that will be uh, having us through uh, that week. But importantly for now is uh, we are with you. We know everyone is affected and we need to find a way of uh, solving this uh, question, uh, either through mobilization, I don't know. But we need to find a way. We need to wake up as a people and, uh, and change the course of action. May God bless Uganda.